Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our Sunday morning service. It's good to see you. It's good to have you with us, and welcome to you if you are here for the first time. If you are visiting us this morning, you are very warmly welcome indeed, and welcome also to those who are joining us on the live stream from your own homes. It's good to see the Sunday schools. Great to see you with us today, and I hope you had a really good Easter holiday and that you're looking forward to the rest of the time that you have in school. And we look forward to sharing some time with you as well this morning before you go through to your own class. A few intimations before we begin our worship this morning. Uh, As this is the Manish communion season, uh, there will be no evening English service here this evening. Uh, at 6 o'clock. A service tonight in Manish is at 6 p.m. and will be led by the Reverend Ben Johnston. And as we have done over the past while, there will be a, a minibus leaving the TI car park uh, here in Tarbert at 5.15 p.m. And we would encourage people to use the minibus if you at all can, as uh, many will be aware the parking at uh, the, the church in Manish is quite Uh, restricted so do please uh, use the minibus if you can Uh, and we are very thankful indeed to Donny for offering to drive the minibus for us and for Loch's Motor Transport for agreeing to its use. Uh, There is a Gaelic psalm singing event this evening at Scalpe Free Church and that's this evening at 7.30 p.m. uh, to which all are very warmly invited to come along. Kirk session meet on Wednesday evening, on Tuesday evening, sorry, at uh, 7.30 p.m. Tuesday the 23rd meeting in the McRae Centre next door to us, Tuesday 23rd at 7.30 p.m. Prayer meeting on Wednesday night the 24th of April at 7.30 p.m. Meeting in person in the church hall and online as a hybrid meeting uh, as always on the Zoom live stream. Services next Lord's Day at the usual times, 11 o'clock in English and 6 p.m. in Gaelic. Our call to worship and our opening psalm is taken from Psalm uh, 84. Uh, The opening words of Psalm 84 from uh, the new revised uh, standard version. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, indeed it faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. So let us worship God together by singing to God's praise and mission praise number 247, a lovely paraphrase of Psalm 84, how lovely is thy dwelling place, O Lord of hosts, to me.
come to God in prayer. Let's talk to God and let's pray together. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words, these familiar words of the psalmist that we have sung together in this different and lovely uh, paraphrase. How lovely is thy dwelling place, O Lord of hosts to me. My soul is longing and fainting, the courts of the Lord to see. And O God, we thank you for the time you have given us to meet, for this desire that we have to be together on this Sunday morning, and for a lovely Sunday morning it is too, to be together in the house of God, and to uh, come together in worship. And, and at the outset, at the beginning of our meeting today, Lord, we ask that you would take over this service, that you would be at the center of everything that is done as we sing, as we pray, as we talk about different parts of the Bible, and as we think about your word, as we uh, ask your blessing upon the Sunday school who are with us as well today, Lord, in their own class, Lord, that they would too know your blessing. And Father, make us truly thankful for all that you have given us, for all the good mercies of God towards us in Jesus. And as we meet together today, we ask, Lord, that for all of us, whether we are here in the church or whether we're watching the live stream, from the youngest person to the oldest in the building and watching and listening at home, Lord, that we would all hear your voice, that we would all know your peace in our hearts and that you would undertake for us all. We thank you for your love for us and even as we look back over the Easter holidays and all the uh, blessings that we knew then, that we would remember at the same time that it is because Jesus died and rose again that we mark that and give thanks for your great love towards us all. We ask that you would hear our prayers this morning as we pray for other people, as we will pray for other people later in the service too, as you would help us to remember those who we ourselves know and love and pray for and lift before you in our prayers, Lord. Make us truly thankful for all that you give us and praying that you would hear us as we give thanks to for the offerings of God's people that we now dedicate for the work and for the service of Christ and his church throughout this world. We ask that you would hear our prayers as we continue in worship together in the words that the Lord Jesus Christ has taught us in the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to Sunday School. It's great to have you with us again this morning. And I, I don't want to say too much about what your own talk or what your own uh, class and lesson is going to be uh, next door when you go through to the hall. But what I'm going to do when we get this up on the screen is to, to think about one special uh, part of the, the story you're going to think about. So today I'm asking the question, do you think about the Roman Empire? Now, some people can already say, you can shake your heads and say, no, I definitely don't, like Bell does, definitely don't think about the Roman Empire at all. I think the question has been asked, I think, more on the internet, and it's been maybe asked of people to ask their dads, their husbands, their grandpas, do men think about the Roman Empire a lot? Maybe sometimes, maybe every day. 
Well, I have to confess that I probably do think about the Roman Empire every day, and I don't know what that says about me, but maybe I have an excuse because I'm a minister and I can't go into the New Testament of the Bible without thinking about what we read about there in the Gospels. It was everything that happens at the time of Jesus took place during the time of the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was huge. You can see it there. That's where uh, Jesus would have lived there in that part there in, in uh, Judea and in Galilee. But that all that huge area there down into Africa, over into Spain, France, Italy, part of Germany and England was all part of the Roman Empire. Except, can anyone tell me what wasn't part of the Roman Empire? Joy. Scotland wasn't part of the Roman Empire. And there you see Hadrian's Wall. Now, we might say that Hadrian's Wall was built to keep the English out, but that wouldn't be very nice, would it? But the Romans actually built Hadrian's Wall, I think it was, to keep the, the, the tribes of the north, the Picts, from marauding further south. Now, over the years, I have to say I've become quite fond of some of the, the films. Some of the films, like Ben-Hur, a real classic about... Uh, and it is a, a wonderful film that you sometimes do see at Easter time, uh, taking part during the Roman uh, Empire, and Spartacus uh, with Kirk Douglas. And these are two wonderful films from long ago, more recent, Russell Crowe and Gladiator. And this one, The Eagle, was set in Scotland. But one film that I want to talk about maybe more than anything is this one, Centurion. Because Centurion was based in Scotland as well. And it's really about that soldier, not that person there, but the soldier, the Centurion, that you're going to be thinking about later on. The Centurion was a very uh, important Roman soldier. He had a part to play. He was in charge of a hundred other soldiers because that's where the word century, century. We know how many years are in a century. There's a hundred years in a century. And a Roman soldier was, uh, a Centurion was in charge of 100 others and they are mentioned a few t times in the Bible. And I'm only going to show you a couple of them. Uh, this was a man called Cornelius. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. And the thing about uh, Cornelius was that he is believed to be the first person to become a Christian who wasn't actually Jewish before. <laughs> He was the first Gentile convert, someone who became a Christian uh, at that time. And then there's another mention of a centurion as well, and maybe a better known one, from Mark chapter 15, when Jesus died on the cross, and when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. So you're going to think about a centurion today, but I'm not going to say any more about the story of the centurion because you'll learn about that uh, in your own class through in the hall. So let's come to God and pray once again. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus, we turn to you today and we give thanks for the the wonderful confession that the, the centurion made at the cross. This hard soldier of Rome was at the same time able to say, truly this man was the son of God, as he said that about Jesus. And, and so we ask, Lord, that you would bless the Sunday school, bless all the Sunday school and their own friends who might join them on the, the live stream as well on the Zoom. And bless those who can't be here as well, Lord. We lift them before you too and bless their teachers. Bless their mums and dads and grandparents as well. We thank you for them all, Lord. And 
pray that you would bless their time together in the hall as they sing songs and as they learn uh, of the Bible story as well. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. I'm going to sing again, and as we sing these words, the, the Sunday school will go through to the hall. We sing from Psalm 43, the verses 3 to 6. O oh, send thy light forth and thy truth, let them be guides to me. So we sing to God's praise in Psalm 43, the verses uh, 3 to 6 to God's praise. O oh, send thy light forth and thy truth. scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of the prophet Isaiah chapter 2 and the verses 1 to 5 and I'd like to invite Kenny to read the passage to us. Isaiah chapter 2 and from the beginning and it's headed the mountain of the Lord. This is what Isaiah son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days the mountains of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Many people will come and say come Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war any more. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. 
Amen. May God bless to us that reading. Thank you very much, Kenny. Let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we take this opportunity and give thanks for this time to bow our heads before you and pray to come before you in thanksgiving with thanksgiving and in thankfulness for all that you have given us we ask Lord that you would bless to us the reading of your word and uh, that these words that we have read this morning might uh, speak to us and reveal to us the truth of God's word uh, in a time when we need that word and that promise and that hope more than ever. Help us as we do so to come in thankfulness that we are reminded that we are not alone, that there are others and even, yes, in this village and throughout the island and these islands, throughout our nation, throughout our world. There are many who are praying as we are and seeking after the face of God as we seek to do too. Praying that you would bless all that is done as individually and collectively we come together in worship, praying for your hand to be upon us, praying that we might hear your voice and that by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would strive with us and speak to us. And as we are gathered together, Lord, we thank you for those who gather with us. We remember this morning all who would love to be here if their circumstances were different. We remember those who have been uh, sidelined, laid low because of illness, because of age and infirmity, because of all kinds of other commitments of work or family, of care. We lift them before you in our prayers as well. We lift our friends, our brothers and sisters in Manish, who will be meeting in Manish Church this morning for the, the Lord's Supper. We pray that you would bless both pastor and people together, the Reverend Ben Johnston and all of them as they meet together, uh, worshiping God and sharing in the broken body and the shed blood and symbolized for us in the bread and in the wine. Help us, Heavenly Father, to continue to pray for each other in such days as this. We remember at the same time all others who are laid low through illness. We remember them as they in Harris House. We remember them in the Leverborough home, in Tahifurst in Stornoway, as well as in the hospital. Particularly, we remember this morning the Reverend Murdo Smith, who will be undergoing an operation in the next few days. We pray that that will be successful, and we lay both him and the family, Alice and Ian and Gordon and Siobhan, we lift them before you this morning again, and pray that you would bless them. And as we Pray for murder. We, we remember our friend and our brother Roddy Mackenzie, who has himself ministered here in these last few months as well. And pray as he continues to receive treatment that he would know your hand of healing and blessing. And we lay himself and Wilma and the family before you today and pray that you would bless and be to them all that they need. And we again continue to remember the Reverend Ian Morrison and in Auburn and 
lift him before you too, O God. Pray that you would be to him all that he needs now and in the days ahead that he might be very conscious of your near presence and your blessing to him. We give thanks, Heavenly Father, that uh, little George, Ian, Sc- Ian and Ruth Scarhall's little grandson seems to be better and responding to treatment, although the treatment was challenging in itself. And we would ask your blessing to be with them and to be to them all that they need as a family. We remember our dear brother, Ian McInnes, and we lift him again before you in our prayers and we miss him from not only the meetings on the Lord's Day but the midweek too. And pray that your hand of healing and blessing might be made known to him and for him. And O oh God, we thank you for all that you have given us and blessed us with and bestowed upon us. And for all these mercies, we are so thankful, especially for Christ our Saviour. Praying that you would go before us as we continue in worship of you here this morning. Make us truly thankful for all that you have given us and never to neglect to give thanks for the, the least of these things, the least of these blessings that we sometimes forget and are less mindful of. Praying that you would go before us now, Lord, as we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We sing again to God's praise before we uh, turn to uh, look at the word that Kenny read from Isaiah chapter 2. We sing together, My heart is filled with thankfulness to him who bore my pain, who plumbed the depths of my disgrace and gave me life again. A hymn of thanksgiving to Jesus, My heart is filled with thankfulness.
as I said at the prayer meeting on Wednesday, I do feel led by God to come uh, to the book of the prophet Isaiah uh, and to look at uh, that book uh, for the next while as a, a, a basis or a, a landing base for the, 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 the preaching and the sermons. It is a daunting uh, thought and prospect and a challenging one as well. It's not one I take lightly. It's not something that I've ever attempted before, and I'm not going to uh, say that it's, it's not going to be an ex, a systematic look at every single chapter and verse in the, the book of Isaiah. Uh, it's not something I feel capable of doing, and believe me, I don't think you would want me to either. It's quite a a difficult book in some ways, although it is absolutely a beautiful book as well. And I hope that those who were at the prayer meeting on Wednesday, whether uh, there in the hall or whether watching online, as you heard, uh, when we hear back uh, in, in maybe one continuous reading, as I try to do, going through from chapter 1 to chapter 66, these passages that are well known to us. We just read and we hear that there are so many of them. When we read them all, hear them all, read continuously, we read so many places that we've been blessed by. So many verses that are familiar to us. So many parts of Scripture. Oh yes, I remember that. Or... Oh, is that where that verse comes from? So many parts of Scripture we've been blessed by maybe over our lifetimes. Parts of Scripture we've been challenged by. Parts of Scripture we've been captivated by, inspired by, maybe even convicted by. And we realize that this is, yes, it's a big book. It's a big book of Scripture, but it is God's Word. And God does still speak through His Word. And it's not all a picture of gloom and doom. I say I was a man of His day and was given a vision for a reason. And he declared that vision, he declared that word as God laid it upon his heart. As we read at the very beginning of Isaiah chapter 1, through the reign of four different kings, and we believe over the span of 40 years. And he was faithful to his task. Declaring that vision, declaring that prophecy to a people who didn't want to hear. And whether that was the king on the throne or down to the ordinary people, they didn't want to hear, by and large. And that's replicated in the the life and testimony of, say, other prophets like Jeremiah as well. But what we are being shown in the book of the prophet Isaiah is a wonderful glimpse, not just of God doing what God does, a God of righteousness as the judge of all the earth. But we see glimpses of his glory. We see the coming of the Messiah. We see these prophecies of Jesus. We read that Christmas. But we also see these words that are often read at Easter. We see Christmas and we see Easter long before we ever thought of Christmas and Easter or had ever heard about it. 700 years before these events in the Gospels unfolded. We see prophetically, we see the cradle, but we also see the cross. Here we are being shown the prophetic witness of our our real man. A man called Isaiah of Jerusalem, a man who was believed to be a a counselor of at least four kings, who certainly had the ear of the king, whether the king responded or listened, 
which in most cases they didn't. But I'd like us to look at the verses that Kenny read from the beginning of chapter 2. It is a a wonderful passage uh, that does bring encouragement to us. And it's really the whole of that passage, verses 1 to 5. It begins with that word, come, let us. Go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And as we see, as we will hopefully see over the while, looking through the book of Isaiah, we see familiar phrases and repeated phrases as well. And one of these things, and it's not unique to Isaiah, but he says, in that day or on that day, a day when God will do something, whether that will be to bring about judgment or whether that will be to bring about release and blessing, it will be a time coming when God's will and purpose is done. When we look at the beginning of Isaiah chapter 2, we see it's not quite the same phrase. It speaks of the last days. But yes, a day that is coming. And he is given a vision of the holy city of Jerusalem and its temple again becoming prominent. Isaiah describes a mountain, Mount Zion, as being the glory and the envy of the world a place and a city that will draw the nations and be the talking point of all. I think it's fair to say that the Middle East is the focus of much of the world's attention and the talking point for many as well, but for all the wrong reasons. As people come Scotland to climb the hills as people would even come to Harris to climb the hills. God is saying through his word, through his prophet, the day will come when people will come to this mountain, to the house of the God of Jacob, and they will go where God is to hear the law going forth from Zion. And this is a picture which seems so completely outlandish and completely weird in the light of how things are today. This would be probably described by one of my university professors as pie in the sky when you die. But God's word is speaking to us of a time coming however hard it might be for us to imagine. And it does fly in the face of the way things are, or the way things as we comprehend them are. The mountain of the Lord will be the focus of the world's attention, but for all the right reasons. And I'd like to think of three different things And it's what God will do. And in the first place, the Lord will establish his place. He speaks of the mountain of the Lord. And he speaks of this as being so different from anything that could be imagined. The mountain that is established is where Christ is reigning in the heart. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. I may have shared this story with you before. I don't know. I can't remember. Maybe you can't either. But I just wonder if we've ever personally known a time 
when you know without doubt that God is real, and you know without doubt that God has spoken, and you cannot deny that, A long time ago now, Alison and I were at, and we only had two of the family at that time, we were at a, a Christian conference in St. Andrew's clan gathering. We were at a pastor and wife's day and a time for prayer uh, was uh, at the end of the day when pastors and wives could be prayed for and we were all allocated to someone who would pray for us. And the man who prayed for us was not one of the well-known leaders of any of anything that was happening. He was one of those who just got on and did his work. But I will always be grateful and give thanks to God for a man called Simon Yates. He saw our name badges. I love Lewis. He said, oh, wonderful, I love Lewis. Revival, blessing. He put his hands on us. And he started to pray for us. And he said, you minister in a place of great darkness. And then he started to pray and take us into God's presence. And I'm not kidding you when I say that there was a pool of tears in between Alison and I as this man talked to us, spoke to God for us. And he prayed this prayer, Lord, establish your mountain in this place called Ness. Now, if anyone knows Ness, it's as flat as a bowling green. It's not like Harris in that sense, but that wasn't the kind of mountain that this man was praying about at all. And that's not what I say I was speaking of, but a place where God is king, where God's temple is established, and this is a mountain that Everest will be envious of. And that is because of the one who is the king in residence there. And this is the picture of a reality that we sometimes don't always, and we can't always understand. We're convinced, and our world would convince us even more so, that this is all there is. And that this world, as we have it, is all that there will ever be. But God is speaking of a different place. And we're going to sing at the end of our meeting this morning that well-known paraphrase, Behold the Mountain of the Lord. In paraphrase 18, The beam that shines from Salem's towers shall light in every land. The king who reigns in Salem's towers shall all the world command. And I was thinking of that in relation to what Isaiah is saying here, this wonderful mountain, and we've all seen that famous picture of, uh, that Edmund Hillary took of Tenzing Norgay when they eventually climbed Mount Everest. And they, had, they could say, we've done it. We've reached the roof of the world. You may be seeing that equally famous photograph taken uh, from World War II of the United States Marines planting the, the, the stars and stripes on Mount Suribachi in Iwo Jima after a great loss of life. It's as if they're saying, we have conquered. God has placed his own banner on the mountain. And we know what that banner is. That is the cross. 
Psalm 2 and verse 8 puts it in this way. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth, your possession. These places where people will plant the flag as to show we have done it, we have conquered, we have come, we are here. The mountain of the Lord is not a place where anyone other than God will reign and rule and light a beacon that will lighten the whole of this world. And again, I see as words have to be read in the light of the New Testament. I, if I be lifted up from the earth, Jesus said, will draw all people to me. The Lord will establish his place, but the Lord will also exercise his power. Because we read in Isaiah chapter 2, these verses 3 and 4, and many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. What is it that we see in our world today? Isn't Isn't it true that the world is in ferment? It's completely, it's needing what we read of here more than ever. In thinking about preaching this morning, I went to what we will speak about later on, obviously, about God bringing all warfare to an end, but bringing disputes to an end as well. We need someone who is going to be a judge or arbitrator between the nations. We see even if it doesn't come out in as open warfare between nations, isn't it true to say that there is this constant dispute between the nations of our world and dispute between the nations and the peoples of each of these nations too? And Isaiah is pointing out that there is one who will proclaim the law and who will judge between the nations and who will decide the disputes for many peoples. One of the accusations that was made against Jesus in the New Testament was that he broke the law. That he broke the law of Moses and the Old Testament. Well, he didn't. We know that. What Jesus did do was fulfill the law. He fulfilled it and brought the law to perfect completion. And he alone is the God who can broker peace. Remember, we will come on, even although it might not be at Christmas, we will come on to think of what Isaiah says in chapter 9 about the promise of the Messiah, the promise chosen, deliverer and amongst those names and titles he is given he will be called as we know wonderful counselor mighty God everlasting father and prince of peace and all these age old feuds and squabbles between nations states ethnic groups faith groups, churches, will be settled in a way that no ordinary judge, arbiter, or commission ever could. In doing some research for this sermon today, I I went to my old friend Wikipedia uh, to, to look at what, how many conflicts are going on in our world today 
and I actually gave up. We only hear of one or two. We only hear of maybe what's happening in the Middle East, in Israel and Gaza, or Ukraine-Russia conflict. Maybe one or two others, like what's happening in Yemen. But there are so many, I actually gave up. We, we don't hear about them. But the fact that we don't hear about them doesn't mean that God doesn't know or that God doesn't care or that it is impossible for God to bring about peace in the light of human history as well as just the history of the Bible. It does seem as if what is being said in Isaiah chapter 2 is completely impossible. And left up to mankind, left to humanity, it would be. But the, di the Bible doesn't speak of something being left solely to humanity, thankfully. And we dare not make that mistake either. It's only when God is brought into the equation that peace will ever come about and there ever will be a reconciliation between the peoples of this world. And what I say is saying there will be a day coming when people will learn. Learn to walk in God's ways and will follow his commands in obedience to his law. And again, we think automatically that's impossible. Well, yes, if it's left up to us, it is. But again, we dare not leave God out of the picture. God exercises his power to have his law demonstrated and lived out in this world. And ultimately the Lord will establish his peace on this earth. And that's why, that's why it seems so impossible to us. And again it is, if it's just depending upon us. I went through the Old Testament trying to count the number of battles there are in the Old Testament. Uh, I should have quote, referred to someone, I know someone who knows all these things, knows about every battle that's ever been fought. I counted 83 and then again I lost count. But when we read Isaiah chapter 2, and what is being written in verse 4 about a day coming when there will be no war and when the weapons of warfare and the means of destruction will be used for the production instead, spears turned into uh, pruning hooks and swords into plowshares. It, it seems exactly the opposite in our world today. It seems as if what, what Runrig sang about in Protect and Survive seems to be the case. You took your sacrifice to the gods of war, traded your children's lives for a mess of gold, and you beat your plowshares into swords, breathing free. It seems to be that that's our world. But again, left up to us, it would be. But what God is saying through the word of Isaiah chapter 2 is looking forward into the future when the nightmare of human war will not even be a distant memory. When the bitterness and hatred that fuels war will no longer exist. And we see that so much today. And it reminds us that we're nowhere near that and left up to our own devices, 
That's how things would be. Our world and our history doesn't speak well of us. But God is showing us, and Isaiah shows us very clearly, not just in this passage but in others, that no matter how dark the situation, there is always hope. Because what Isaiah does is show us the reality but comes back to the cross. He shows us how things are and how things have to change. But he always gives us that glimpse of glory that I've spoken to you before a few times, I think. When you've flown into Stornoway Airport and it's always in cloud. It always seems to be so cloudy. But now and again, now and again, the plane just happens to fly through that cloud and you see the bright sunshine and you think it's really nice. Why can't it be like this all the time? And then you're back into the cloud again. That's what I see in the book of the prophet Isaiah, a glimpse of hope, sunshine, a ray of hope, maybe in a dark world. And everything that this world is uh, engineered and geared towards will have changed. I think it was, I read a headline today that the United States have committed $61 billion uh, of aid to Ukraine. And I'm not saying that that's something that doesn't have to happen, but that's all the, the spears and the swords. That's all the military equipment that one day Isaiah says will no longer be needed. And it's as if people will say, well, what are these things for? What did they do? Why did we ever need these things? Again, we think that's impossible. That just can't happen. And yes, left up to us, it would be impossible. But praise God that what Isaiah is showing us is that things are not left up to us. Isaiah goes on from what he says in chapter 2 to speak of a whole catalog of judgment against the people, the people of Israel, the people of Judah, and all the surrounding nations, and concentrating on God's own people because they were the ones who failed. But then the glimpse of glory comes in the person of the Savior. And that is how the Lord will establish his peace on this earth. Because God is saying one day, one day it will all come to an end. And the Prince of Peace will reign one day. Everything will be as light. You know, in our world we go on about the darkness so often. It's not just the thief and the criminal uh, that likes the darkness. Uh, the, the general and the admiral know just as much how, how much of an ally that is, the darkness is to them. But Jesus is the light of the world. The darkness hides, but the light exposes even the dark places. And what Isaiah chapter 2 is showing us at the very beginning is there will be a day when the Lord will establish his peace and he will establish his peace as he has shown us in the person of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that God would bless his word to us this morning. Let's pray together again. Heavenly Father, as we 
come to the end of our meeting this morning, help us to come in thankfulness uh, that you are the, the light of the world and that you are indeed the, the Prince of Peace. We pray that you will part us with your blessing this morning, Lord, and make us truly thankful for all that you have given us. And even although it might seem a, a world away uh, to live in peace, in the peace that the Bible speaks of when war is remembered or studied no more. Help us truly to give thanks uh, that a day is coming when the mountain of the Lord will be uh, the wonder of all the world and the talk of every nation. We pray that you will part us with your blessing, Lord, and Go before us as we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We're going to sing in closing then in paraphrase 18. Paraphrase 18, it's taken from Isaiah chapter 2. Uh, most of the Scottish paraphrases were actually taken from uh, parts of Scripture uh, at about in the 18th and 19th centuries. And we know these familiar words. Behold the mountain of the Lord in latter days shall rise on mountain tops above the hills and draw the wandering eyes. Paraphrase 18, Behold the mountain of the Lord.
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit rest upon and remain with us all now and forevermore. Amen.